dreadful omission of not thanking Steve, who um, has been getting compliments online about the clarity and uh, wonderfulness of his, of his AV, AV production um, on YouTube. But he has <laughs> done a, just a fantastic job. Uh, he is um, streaming this live, recording it for posterity. We can have it up on YouTube in the future and, um, and help him with all this PA. So I'm, I'm really grateful to you, Steve, for your attention in this. So our next speaker is David Hensel, who was commissioned by the, the church here to produce the crucifix that you see on the, on the Meredos. And as Francis said, it sits um, against the, the new painting by Julian Bell. And tomorrow we'll hear from Julian about his experience um, painting for this church uh, as a descendant of the Bells. Um, but David came, came to this church. This, we think, is his only um, commission. You can't recall any others. <laughs> so, That's um, just... Uh, you know. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, as we'll hear, he's done a remarkable job of addressing the, the challenging subject of a crucifix um, within a possibly even more challenging context. David's uh, a jeweller and a sculptor whose um, work can be found in, in collections of the, uh, the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, which is a stunning collection. I've been lucky enough to go into their vaults and see some of their work, uh, the V&A and the Arts Council. Um, he's, uh, he's from a, a Christian family, and I think we might hear a bit more about that and how that's influenced some of your work over the years. Thank you. Good, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we made the cross about five years ago, five and a half years ago. And um, there's a booklet which I think is in your pack, uh, which is probably a lot more thorough than what I'll say today. I mean, I was thinking at one point that I would simply read to you what's in the, <laughs> in the booklet. Um, but either it would take too long or I'd want to deviate from it and add all sorts of new thoughts and so on. Because in five years, you think about it a lot. And um, hopefully, uh, some, of the, some of the thoughts will seem relevant. Um, at the time, when we did it, when we first did the talk about it and we were making it... Um, I ask Peter Blee why people come to the church and he said to find peace. He also said that if you put art in a sacred place, it affects the way you pray. And um, to make a, an altar cross is a focal point of the church and it's got to work as a a piece of the church's function as a sort of center of the faith. It's not uh, just a matter of decoration. It's a matter of sort of a core principle. Um, perhaps if you could have the first picture there. That's what you're looking at anyway. Um, so it's a great responsibility to make a sculpture and um, especially for a place like this, because it's got to serve those kind of purposes. Um, on the subject of peace, someone I know who passed away recently came here frequently to be in the church and with the cross. And it seemed to be very important to her to come here and to be here. And I believed it helped her to resolve her fear of eternity. It helped to make it safe to die. And I'm sure that Peter has, he told me one or two, um, I'm sure that Peter has many such experiences. And that's got to be the function of the church from one point of view. Um, so, you know, that's part of the responsibility of making something that is going to work like that. It's got to be um, it's got to work, you know, it's got to, it's got to be right as an object. There's a vast amount of art that's been produced over the centuries um, using this cross as a subject. I mean, it's symbolic of the Christian faith in many ways. It's 
ideas, its beliefs, its certainties, its support for the dying and for forgiveness. And among the symbols is the way it represents a crossroads, a meeting place. And how long has this church been here? A thousand years? It's, it's served as a meeting place all that time um, without any other function. Um, and art is storytelling. It offers people ways to understand these values. There are similarities between how we approach art objects and how we respect sacred ones. For both of them, there's a generosity, a willingness to open yourself to them, to allow them to affect you. And, um, you know, that one has to provide something that will allow people to engage with it in that kind of way. I mean, we did think about making something which was a, uh, a very modernist um, cross, maybe made out of a piece of aeroplane from the 1940s. I mean, it would have been a nice thing to do, but um, it, it seemed like that would not be enough of a message, really, for, for this. Um, when we encounter an art object, we intuitively mirror it. We sense its physical presence. We try it on. But we do that instantly. We do it before we label it, before our emotions and expectations take hold. So it, something, we allow something to come into our space and have an effect on us. And, um, you know, that's, that's something that the cross has got to do. It's got to serve that. Uh, actually, the psychology of that process has been well understood and used to influence the style of art in churches for centuries. Um, but we felt it was important to keep to the representational approach to the paintings, just as they are to the, the way they kept to representational paintings here. It seems to me to... Uh, refer back to the days before the whitewash of the Reformation, when all the paintings were painted out. And um, if you think about the effect that the had, that had on the population, it must have distanced people from the stories in a very specific kind of way. I mean, the, the paintings were portraits of the population in the same way that these are. And um, the population during the Middle Ages would have been largely illiterate, so they would see themselves in the role of the saints and in the role of the ne'er-do-wells. And in a way, the loss of those images was like a mirror being destroyed. It was quite a kind of cultural... Uh, vandalism in a way to destroy all the images of the people and that's one of the wonderful things about these paintings in a way they put that back they restore that connection with the population and um, uh, you know hopefully they can get through your thick skin a bit differently than a church that is totally devoid of images um, I mean, I'm aware that a lot of people come here to see the paintings and do see them as a historical interest rather than appreciating them as part of a living church uh, with a presence that serves the community. And um, it seems that preserving that tradition is part of the value of it. So the challenge was to make an art object which uh, would fit in with this and uh, serve as a living sacred object uh, that would be worthy of contemplation as well as relating to the, to the existing art. So it's not a matter of designing something so much as sort of growing something which would work with the with church's function. Um, it's not for me to tell you how one should, how you should relate to it, but um, you know, all I can do is to, to sort of talk about how I came to make this particular church.
across. Um, I've been very fortunate in having quite a broad education. My parents were highly motivated Christians. They'd met while they were being missionaries in Kashmir. My father was a doctor and my mother was a trained nurse and they, uh, they really valued their Christian beliefs as a way of what they were bringing to the, the people in Kashmir. I mean, that's all changed somewhat. But, um, you know, when they came back to this country, uh, we lived in a small village in Dorset and um, really the only thing that went on was the way my mother used to run the Sunday school, all the church fates, uh, you know, tremendous amount of uh, enthusiasm for preaching she had. And, um, you know, so that's how we were brought up. There weren't many other people. There was just that kind of influence and there were always visiting missionaries and visiting people who uh, obviously shared their values and uh, quite the effect that had on me um, it's hard to say but one of the things that this making this cross allowed me to do was to explore and uh, remember all of those people and to try to bring something of their values into making the cross and I'll show you some of the pictures in a moment um, in a moment no uh, Seems to be a bit of talking here about things before we get to that. Um, so, you know, I had that education of being brought up by very religious people. I did natural sciences at university. And I've spent much of my life involved in the arts. And, um, you know, we're, the title of this conference is Art, Faith and the Natural Environment and it seems to me that for years that there are three main ways that we approach our explorations of the unknown. They are art, they're religion and they're science. And um, science is concerned with strict questions about the world. Religion is concerned with, among other aspects, opportunity to celebrate and wonder at the mysteries of the creation and art is storytelling about it all. It is storytelling and all of these have played a part in making the cross so um, perhaps now the photos, Let's, I can't remember which the first ones were. Let's a bit closer up next one. Next one, please, yeah. Um, that is, these are all in this booklet, by the way, so um, with one or two exceptions. Um, so this is, this is partly about the influences that uh, were behind the particular design of this cross. That was a, a crucifix that's in St. George's Chapel in Windsor and it's made by Don Potter, who was the sculpture teacher at my school. Um, I didn't know until recently that he had been Eric Gill's main assistant for many years. Uh, but, you know, that was a nice connection to have, to, to see some real sculpture. I mean, he made very interesting things around the school while I was there. And uh, even though I was doing science, it was, uh, they didn't let me do art, you know, you had to do science. And um, anyway, um, the next one, can you? Eric Gill lived in Ditchling, and while he was a bit of a funny chap, um, I love his art, you know, I love his carvings and particularly his his drawings, wonderful sense of line and um, I find that very expressive. And that's a um, sculpture which is in Wells Cathedral 
And um, I always forget his name. So it is. Oh, hang on a minute. Why won't it let me get into this thing? Estcourt J. Clack. And um, it's made of yew wood. And I don't know how big it is, but it's quite big. And it's called R Risen Christ. And it's got a wonderful uplift to it. A wonderful levitation to it. But um, it seemed to me that there's quite a lot of effort in the expression of it. Looks like he's sort of really trying hard to, to rise. And I'll say more about this, but you know, I wanted to get something with our cross that was much more peaceful. Okay, um, next one. That's uh, just an example of how one gets inspired by what people have done in the past. That's Bernini, and it's from about 1680, I think. And supposedly he made that, he carved that when he was 82, or at least worked on it. So, uh, you know, there's hope for all of us, I think. <laughs> um, We didn't have much art around the house. I think my parents were too busy being religious. <laughs> and uh, that, that was really the only painting there. There were a few paintings of the Himalayas and, uh, and this. And uh, I guess that provided an image of Jesus as, uh, as they wanted us to see him. You know, the instruction was always that we were to be good and Jesus was always watching and uh, caring for us. And, uh, you know the paintings, Holman Hunt. Next point. Right, this is the first of a lot of drawings which I did when we were first, it was first suggested we could make this cross. And, you know, we were thinking about doing something abstract or whatever we were doing. And the way that one works is to, as soon as you have a project to do, you get about a five years' worth of ideas that pop up immediately. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of scribbles and a lot of questions that are asked by simply doing drawings and sketches and thinking about it that way. And um, that's one of them. The next one. This was another idea to make an ebony cross and um, with a galaxy of inlaid mammoth tusk ivory stars, a very jewel-like thing. And uh, we, you know, we thought a lot about actually using the cross, but in the end we decided that we would dispense with the actual cross and simply have a figure of Christ in the shape of a cross. And I think the next one, this is the drawing which was first approved by the church. Um, um, and the, the idea that I had was to get a large piece of wood and make a very bulky cross out of it and then carve the wood away to find the essence of Jesus within it. And... Um, you know, that would have been a, quite a nice thing to do, uh, except the trouble was that um, I felt it would come out looking very wooden. Um, and, as it says in the booklet, I think um, when I came to start it exactly a year ago, that was then, I was unwell and all I could do was to think about it by making a clay model. So, you know, I started working on the clay and um, 
the way of working was to um, work all over it, over and over again. Every day I would tear it down and rebuild it as a clay model. And, um, you know, trying to find out what it was that it needed to express by, uh, by doing it. And um, it's a bit like performing a piece of music. You know, you rehearse it every day. And eventually you get to be able to get it right in one go. You know, and this seemed to be my way of working, that I would do that. And what was very interesting, um, I'll read this, is that what happened immediately was fascinating. A deluge, a flood of awarenesses of the character of all of the people who had surrounded me in the years of my Christian upbringing. As I worked, they would appear in the clay, showing their stance, their qualities, their attitudes, their body shapes, their gestures, their words, their messages, their exhortations, their criticism and their kindnesses. I'd, I had no idea I'd observed all of these attitudes, but they all appeared in the clay wanting to be included. And um, so, you know, I would spend two to three hours a day, every day, reworking it in order to sort of experience them and to try and find out what it was. But um, again, they were all expressions of some kind of zeal or determination or uh, kind of action of some sort. And I felt it was important to have something that was much stiller, much more uh, uh, focused on a, on a kind of central stillness. And, um, you know, so one had to sort of move on past all of these people and thank them for coming and, um, and try to find a way to get on with it. And um, that's another one of these people. It was an interesting thing to do. And um, several people I know have, uh, you know, when I, several sculptors have, I think, been encouraged to make crucifixes of their own in order to sort of explore that as a way of working. Um, so, these central figures, when I kind of got the feeling of the figure standing there, floating there, uh, I had to put the winding cloth around it to sort of build it up around it. And um, you can see that here. Uh, this is a white one. This is, these, th there are several of these round and um, they're all made of uh, polyurethane resin, which is a kind of liquid plastic that I've then painted or colored. And um, we had the idea that the winding cloth that was round the, the figure of Jesus uh, should become uh, the whole of nature, that it should represent nature in its, the way that, uh, you know, we're all part of nature and we're all uh, enclosed, bound in by nature and by its influences and its impact and, uh, you know, the central spiritual essence is, is sort of surrounded and enclosed by nature in this sense. And, uh, you know, so I wanted to try to find a way to express that. And uh, so it starts here at the base. And I saw that as a kind of um, a spark, a point where spirit first contacts matter. And that's the sort of origin point for living nature. And so that binds all the way around and develops and becomes a kind of complete tapestry of, uh, of the dragons of our lives. And uh, I also thought it was becoming a bit of a fig leaf, you know, a sort of fig leaf of our discontent. And um, 
But then what happens is, the way I've described this is probably not uh, sort of authentic doctrine somehow, but there's a point here where uh, Jesus materializing in the center separates the complexities. And um, this is like, this is a sort of spark point here. And this is another spark point here where, uh, you know, he transcends the material, transcends duality, and separates all of the energies of nature, leaving a kind of very central clarity. Um, and that's an important point there. The, these strands, the remains of the cloth come round and um, this one wraps round that way and lifts the arm up in that way. And this one, it goes round that way and it brings the arm down that way. So you get two aspects of the kind of attitude which seems to be an important part of the expression of command and control and care and comfort from these things, you know. So this, these two expressions are sort of carried into, into the arms here, leaving this central line. And... Um, a minute. Lost me way. Um... Yeah, what's the next picture? Yeah, um, this is, this is um, Leonardo da Vinci. It's uh, a painting that's in Krakow of a woman with an ermine. And um, I had the good fortune to go to Krakow. And um, the painting is just, I'd seen it in London, in a, behind glass with crowds of people, but... In, um, in the museum in Krakow, it's just in a small room on its own. There's a Raphael painting on one side and this on the other side. There's no guards, there's nothing, you know. I could talk, I could stand close to it for half an hour in the same place that Leonardo would have stood at a paintbrush's distance away from it. And, um, you know, I started to have very strange sensations. Partly because it's such an important piece of uh, painting. But um, there was something else happening, a sensation that I couldn't breathe, uh, which on analysis comes down to the way that we tend to mirror a work of art. We try it on, allowing it to work as a piece of choreography. And um, when I understood how that worked. He'd painted her with a strongly turned head, but no tension in her neck, no tension in the upper part of her body. You would expect to be able to see tension, but um, it seemed that that was such an important kind of recognition that um, this is what one needs to Describe with this cross a kind of complete lack of tension, a complete uh, lack of effort or whatever in the central part of the body and the neck. And uh, the neck is often the last part of a figure to get right. It's where you discover the balance of the head, which is basic to the expression of stance. Uh, we read each other's body language by mirroring. We do the intuitively, the same as people we meet. And uh, it's the same with a piece of art. You do what it's doing, intuitively. And um, so, you know, having realized that, I saw the stances of all the people that I'd mentioned that had come into these clay models as uh, they were visible as sets of tensions as an understanding of their body language. And um, 
complex of tensions translates it translates nicely into sculpture. So um, what I tried to do with the cross here was simply to describe this complete lack of tension in the centre in this sort of way. Take all the gestures, all the movement outwards and just leave this central line as uh, sort of free of tension. So we have to value Leonardo da Vinci in that sense that I don't know why he did that. You know, you'd, you'd think that he would understand about things like body language and tension, but here was this thing, a sort of uh, surprising expression of motionlessness in the center. Um, yeah, this was a wax version. What? What I did, I made it in clay, then I made a series of rubber moulds and cast it in wax and uh, worked on the wax and then made another mould and cast it in resin, a bit like this. Took the resin to the foundry and they made another mould, another wax impression, a hollow one, and then cast that in bronze. So um, there's it covered in this rubber for the mould. And there, there it is in bronze. That's brighter than it is now because bronze darkens over the ages. But, um, you know, I wanted to keep all the, the texture of the handling of it because it would pick the light up. So, um, there we are. That's the next one. That's the back of it. You can see the way the, the winding cloth comes round round behind him. You can't see that here, obviously, but um, yeah, I don't know what's next. That was how it was before Julian's painting came around it. And there it is with the painting. Um, I love the way that he's placed it so that the, the feet of the figure are just above the horizon, which means that it looks as if he's in the far distance as well as coming towards us, which is a kind of expression of motion forwards into the church, which is uh, how, uh, you know, I wanted it to be an expression of uh, a resurrected Jesus sort of materialising in our space. And I, I love the way he's done that. I think they work very well together and it links it more to these kind of paintings. Anyway, um, what I said in a uh, card we produced years ago, five years ago, um, was this. The cross was designed as an image of the resurrection, Jesus poised with outstretched arms, offering welcome, care and blessing. He rises free of the cross, discarding the bindings of the earthly plane, his winding sheet a symbol of nature and the complexities of our lives, which are parted by the light of his hands so that we see him restored, showing the way to inner peace. But now I prefer to think that what I tried to do with the cross was to poetically suggest a point of utter stillness within which there's no need to question just a certainty of the purity of life and to place that within a traditional construct of ritual meditation that gives permission in our lives to practice that timelessness. So, um, really, that's what I hope we've achieved. There's got another page of this. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's... Um, to my mind, it's a story about transcendence. It's about rising out of the complexities of duality to a oneness. On the point of art 
science and religion being our three ways of looking at things. Each in our own way, we're storytellers, making sense of existence as we sense it. The stories may conflict. Each discipline finds its own way of expressing all that is. Each has the responsibility to keep the others in balance. And that contradictions are valuable in furthering understanding. You know, um, I think it's important from that point of view that the, the contradictions that you get that an artist might have about the world, that scientists might have about the world, a, relig a religious person might have, they're different and they do contradict. But I think it's from the still point of within each of the disciplines that you can measure the potential of truth of the others. And it seems to me that the essence and work of all of them is, to put it simply, that we do our best to care for each other. So, uh, you know, this is what one tries to do, I think, with making something like this. You, uh, you know, I mean, me as an artist, I'm coming to it with that kind of background, but um, it's, uh, it's a complex of all of those. Um, so, in a way, one of the things that this cross can serve as is a, it's a visual aid to meditation. I have a feeling that one could spend time mirroring this, doing what it's doing, and to find within that an attitude of prayerfulness and um, an attitude of central stillness and care and all of these other things that this represents. So, uh, you know, that seems to be one of the things that the cross is there to let us do. It's an important point of view to, it's to, to see it as a kind of focal point for the church and it's got to tell the story of it all. So that's about it really. Um, what you can do if you like is wander around for a minute and look at these replicas and look at the way the the, the binding around it is uh, tells a story. And um, maybe you could even try it on and see what it's like to actually sort of take that kind of attitude and expression. Obviously, you don't want to do that in public, but um, or be seen to be doing that. But, you know, it's something that might be interesting to do. So you... Do that for a minute. Or, or we've got some time for questions. What's the time? Okay. So, have a look. No, it's something that um, I designed basically to try to carry that expression. I mean, in my in all the jewels that I've made, I've very often carved faces into uh, all sorts of different materials. And um, so it, was, it wasn't that difficult to, to try to find the expression that I wanted. I mean, ideally it should be more symmetrical. But I see looking at it now that actually it's not symmetrical. It's enormously difficult to, to carve symmetry, to get both sides the same. I mean, maybe that's lacking on my part, I don't know, but um, whether, whether it's got the right expression or not, I don't know, that's up to you whether you see it or not. Sorry, I'm. I'm think I'm going deaf. The rainbow. Yes. Is at the back. Yes. This is the cross that you've done. Yeah. Yes. Just showing to us that God is relevant now and His promises. Yes. I think Julian makes a point of that in his 
in his talk about it, doesn't he? I think you've got that in your pack too, a little booklet about, about his talk, and he, you know, he actually describes it, the booklet. What's the title on the book that he's got there? I, yeah, I set my bow. I mean, that seemed to be a very important, important ingredient, that rainbow. And um, yes, that's right. Genesis 9.13. I think it's great. I think I, I love it. And, um, you know, one has doubts as an artist. You're always filled with self-doubt. It's part of, it goes with the job, really. But, you know, I hope that this is a contribution to the life of the church. It's not just a kind of decorative thing, you know. It's a way of giving something back for all the kind of... Um, life we've been given, you know, to, to give something back to the church. That's it. Say that again? Did you think of Lazarus coming out the tomb? With the being wrapped in... Did I what? Think of Lazarus. Oh, yes. Jesus raised Lazarus. I was looking at that and I think, well, that's the... I didn't think of Lazarus, no. I, mean, I probably should have done. Um, he broke the clothing. Yes. Yes. I mean, th this is one of the things about having an upbringing like we had. You know, one is constantly inundated with these stories all the time, and they sort of sink in and become intuitive in a way. And. Um, Yes, well, it, it's entirely relevant to think of it in terms of Lazarus, but, um, you know, I think, really, I tried to think in terms of the resurrection of Jesus rather than the uh, resurrection of Lazarus somehow. Um, hopefully. Hello. I think it's quite joyful. It's got something light and airy. Thank you. Um, that's what one would hope, you know. I mean, one wants, one wants to get a sense of um, the figure of Christ sort of materialising in human form in this space as, some, as someone who is an example of uh, how to become a better version of ourselves. And, uh, you know, we would want to become light and airy as opposed to um, too heavy going with it all, you know. I mean, I think one of the we found some diaries from my mother's aunts when she was setting off to go to Kashmir, and one of the aunts had written to her saying, um, "Don't do so much preaching." <laughs> Didn't stop her, I don't. Think. Well, thank you. Um, hear about your thought processes and your, your actual creative processes. Thank you. It's really very revealing. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.